I'm afraid to add to it and take away. I tell you what, people just change it to suit themselves. And I'm going to try to take my time this morning. Uh, we've got plenty of time here to uh, get this across. I'm going to touch a few things this morning. But uh, we want to know <laughs> what the gospel is here. In Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start at the 44th verse. I give everybody time to get with me. I'm just going a few places this morning. I like you to read what I'm reading, and then you can't say, well, Brother Glenn told us this or told us that. I want to read to you what the Word of God says, what God's Word says. Now, I asked you this morning, and I'd like you to ask yourself, if somebody comes and asks you why Jesus died on the cross, could you explain to them why he died? We could say, yeah, he died for our sins. But can you, can you under, explain it? Do you have a revelation of it? We need to see this revelation. We need to know why we do something. You know what? A child, we just don't get up one morning and we have a child. There's a whole operation that goes in front of a child being into this world. And the operation of a man and a woman and love coming together. And how the, the, there, there has to be an egg and there has to be a sperm. And I'm not trying to be vulgar, but these things have to come together. God made these things come together and it produces a child. And that's what I'm saying, but there's a whole operation to do it. A lot of people think just going to church and saying, well, I love the Lord and I've received Jesus as my personal Savior. They don't even know Jesus. They don't even know about Jesus. And what we're, when we're saying we receive him as our personal Savior, what we're saying is we're receiving what thus saith the Lord. Because Jesus was not only flesh, but he was the spirit. He was God in the flesh. He was the word of God made flesh. And when we say we receive the Lord, we're saying we receive God's covenant, we receive God's law, and we're going to walk in God's law. This is the name. Do you know there's a lot of Jesuses in the world? Oh, yeah. Jesus is a, a, a Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. -S. There's a lot of Mexican people and Spanish people that use the word Jesus. A lot of people, that's a common name. We can find in the Bible that there's a Jesus justice, there's a bar Jesus, in one place, he was a sorcerer, and it was Jesus Christ. But that name, it separates everything. That's why we're so particular about the name. It means something today to have that name. But in, my, but in Luke 24, when Jesus was getting ready to ascend up into heaven, he told his disciples, he said, and, the, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. All these things had to be fulfilled. It wasn't just something he just come and did, but the prophets spoke about what he was going to do. The Psalms and the law, it foretold what he was going to do. Now in the four, verse 45, this, this is important. He said, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. These people had been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. And he had died and rose from the dead and they still didn't understand who he was or what he was doing. One place Thomas told him, he said, Lord, show his father and it will suffice. In other words, we work, Jesus said, if you've known me, you've known the father. In other words, I, I am the father. I'm with you. I am the father. Today, people are looking for God. God is he's right among us. God's a spirit. He fills every place. But he said he had to open their understanding and me and you, even though we've made a start for God, even though we've repented and we're sorry for what we've done, God still needs to open up the scriptures to us so we can understand what it says, what the revelation is. You know, when you understand something, it means something. It means something, what he's, what's going on. And he said, and he said unto them, thus it is written, it's, got, it's written, that's one witness, and thus it behooved Christ, it's necessary, to Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance, everybody say repentance. Repentance. And remission, everybody say remission. Remission. There's two things there. Of sins should be preached in what? His what? Name. Name. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. When the church starts, you got to preach repentance. You got to preach remission of sins, and he goes on to thirty and forty nine and forty eight. He said, "And ye are witnesses of these things." In other words, I'm telling you, you guys have been walking with me all these years. You saw him crucify me. You saw him nail me to the tree. 
You know, now I'm presently with you. This is after his resurrection. They was witness of these things. And he said, now I want you to go out. I want you to tell people how that they killed me, how that they, they murdered me and they put me in a tomb and they carried, wrapped me in grave clothes and how that I rose from the dead and rolled a stone out of the way. I want you to tell that to the world. And the thing about it is that's what we would need to do today is we need to tell people about this resurrection. But it's more than a story like Joan and the whale, but there is a power behind it. There is a, a victory behind it. There is a way for it to be understood why he had to do this. And he went on and he said, And behold, the repentance and remission had to be preached. And he said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Beth, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. In other words, they went, Sister Darlene, they went and done what the Lord told them to do. He told them to go down and tarry for the promise, which was the Holy Ghost. This is the plan of salvation. You know, just like we got right back here on the wall, Acts 2.38. When Peter, when the church was born, you go right on over into the second. If you read, Luke actually wrote the book of Luke. And he also wrote the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a history book. And if you read Luke, Luke goes right on into Acts. It's because it's, there are two books, but it's called Acts, which means the actions of the apostles, or the history of the early church. That's where it all started. When, he let, when Jesus ascended, and he left this message behind for them to preach. When they went down and they began to gather together in this upper room and they began to worship God, the Bible said the Holy Ghost came like a mighty mushroom men. That was the Father. That was the, the promise of the Father that came. And when all these things happened, people come in there and they couldn't believe what was going on. They hear all these people speaking in tongues and people worshiping and shouting and they, they didn't understand. Some doubted, some made fun. But Peter got up and he began to preach the first message. And he began to tell them that this same Jesus was God Almighty. He came down here on the earth and he gave his life. And he said, and when the men in the, in, of that day and the women was in up the upper room, they were in that meeting those in, they began to question Peter and the other disciples and they said, what, what shall we do? What can we do to rectify this thing? We've rejected the very God of heaven. We've rejected what's right. How many of us has rejected God? How many of us has rejected what's right in our life? Ain't you glad there's an answer? Yes. Ain't you glad there's a way to appease God and be received of him? And Peter told him, he said, he stood up with the other eleven and he said, repent. That's what the, he said over here to preach. He said, first thing you got to do is repent. Repent means to be sorrowful. means to turn away. You know, I'm not going to do it no more. And he said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he said, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to all that are far off, and even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is the plan. He talks about repentance. He talks about baptism. What's baptism for? Remission of sins. For what? Remission of sins. For remission of sins. Why? Because that's what it said, it says. isn't it? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He said, he, over here in Luke, he said that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's where the church started at. That is what we've got to preach. That's what we've got to teach. We've got to teach repentance. But you know what? We need to go on and teach the revelation, Brother Don. We've got to tell people why you have to live. All right. Go with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. God has always been separating his people. Always. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. First, I, I want to I talk just a little bit about something. 
And I know I don't talk about this a lot in church because of the children. But it's talking about circumcision. And I'm sure everybody here knows what circumcision is. It's the movement of the foreskin of the male. And whenever a man is born into this world, it's a pretty common thing now. But every male, when he's born into this world, he's, uncir he's uncircumcised. And God made a covenant with Abraham in the 17th chapter of Genesis. He made a promise that he was going to walk with him. He was going to give him the land of Canaan. He was going to bless his children. But he said, I'm going to make a covenant between me and you. But every one of you, including Abraham, he was 99 years old. He said, I want you. You're going to be circumcised. And every male child among you is going to be circumcised. And now, in other words, the foreskin is going to be removed. And that, that made Abraham and his children and all his people, it made them different from any other people in the world. But you see what I'm saying? Today, that's not a big thing. Back then, you know, you talk about doorkeepers in, in the house of the Lord. They, they checked the males to see if they was. If they wasn't, they didn't enter into the congregation. They didn't enter in among God's people. They didn't fellowship. I mean, that sounds like a pretty uh, perverted thing, you know, that people would check that. But that's that's what that was what they had. And but God was really trying to show them that I'm separating Abraham from every people in the earth by this circumcision. It made their people different than anybody. And anybody that come in among them, whether they were slaves or what they was born into it, they become they became circumcised, and separated. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about about circumcision? Well, this was a type of a shadow. Today, it don't matter whether we're circumcised or not. And I was, like I said, this is something that I can't really speak about in the children, but I'm just we're all adults here this morning. And, but it's, it's a separation. It's a difference. In other words, in the second chapter of Romans, he said, there's, he said it's, it's not he, the Jew, that is one outwardly of the circumcision of the flesh, but it's one that is inwardly of the circumcision of the heart. There is a nature about us that needs to be cut away. It needs to be taken away from us. You all understand what I'm saying? And when, you, when this foreskin of our life and our heart is taken away from us, then we're a different people. We walk different. We dress different. We talk different. Our lives are different. How many glad for the difference? <laughs> Amen. We didn't go, we wasn't circumcised like Abraham, but all of these things are a type. Just like baptism, it's a type of circumcision. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, just like back there, it wasn't just a natural removing of the foreskin, but it's by giving a new heart, by a new purpose, a new life. You all see, you understand what I'm saying? But there's a, there's a big study on circumcision, and in the Bible, it refers to circumcision, it's usually talking about the Jews, it's talking about uncircumcision. It's talking about the Gentiles. It's talking about people that were not Christians, people that didn't live for God, people that were out of the inheritance. You couldn't get in unless you were circumcised. And that's what I'm saying. In our, in the church, in the church of grace, now we have the circumcision that's not made with hands, but it's that operation of God. But I'm going to read here in the book of Colossians. I'm touching a lot of things here, but I, I just want to get across what I'm saying. Uh, Colossians uh, 2 and verse 10. Let's back up to 9. This is Sister Rosemary's favorite verse. I think about her every time that I that I read this. It said, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead body. How many believe that? Alright. And he said, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Talking about, talking about Christ. In whom also ye are, listen now, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Y'all understand what I'm saying now? In other words, it's not talking about a natural circumcision, but it's talking about Christ, the circumcision of Christ. In other words, he cuts away the old man. In other words, when he comes in your life, there's a removing of the old things and the beginning of new things. We have a new life. How many's glad for the adoption, thank God, that we can get in? All right, and he said, he said, for in, uh, he said, 
listen now, buried with him in what? Is baptism important? Yep. How do we get in him? Baptism. We're baptized into him. What we're baptized into, we're baptized into his death. Now, Jesus was God. He looked down on man and the only way he could redeem man is he had to remove the penalty of sin. He had to remove death from mankind. So God came down here and was born of a woman. The Bible said that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and the seed was in her womb and she brought forth the first child which was, she called his name Jesus. He was God but he was man too. In other words that seed was the word of God but still yet he was God. He was the flesh but he was, he was God. It was just like I've said when he walked to the tomb of Lazarus and he wept. That was the man part of him. But the part inside of him that said, Lazarus, come forth, that was God. He was a man, but he was God. In other words, he, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He come down here and he partook of our lives. And what he done is he took all of the sin that we had and he took it all to the, he took it all to the grave. In other words, the only way to get rid of sin is to put it in the grave, to put it, do away with it. You see what I'm saying? So what he done is he come down here in the flesh, and he went through temptation. He went through all the things that we go through, everything we're tempted with. We read in the Bible how the devil tempted him and how he was in the wilderness, but he overcame all of that. He never opened his mouth. He never fought back. He never deride anybody, but he overcome all the sin. He, he took all of your sin, and he took all of my sin. You know what he done with it? He took it in the grave where it belongs. He took it in death. Thank God. He took it in there, and he left it in there, and he rose up and left all of that in the grave. Thank God. In other words, it's dead. That's just like our works. They need to be dead, and we need to raise in newness of life and be a new creature. That's what the resurrection is. It's talking about, we see back there when people go out here on Easter morning, they, they have sunrise service and all that stuff, but the thing about it is the resurrection, it's not out on the hillside, it's not even in the cave, but the resurrection is in me and you. We've got to die like he did. We, we get die and we're baptized into him, and we partake of his life. All right, and he said, in verse 12, he said, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. We're in that operation. You know what? If we go and get an operation at the hospital, you say we've got to get your appendix operation. You know, we got to, what what. Don't mean, we think about an operation just take something out. But there's an operation, in other words, it's a procedure that you go through. There's a, there's a part there where you've got to go in the hospital, you got to lay down on the bed, they put you to sleep, they go in and the doctor removes that, and then there's a healing process. There's a, that's, that's the operation of God. God's got an operation too. It's repentance, and it's, re, it's baptism. It's receiving the Holy Ghost. With well, evidence of speaking another tongue. God has got an operation too. He's bringing you from death. He's bringing you from sin and making you a new creature. And all these things is in it. In other words, when, 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 when these folks get baptized today, they're touching the blood of Jesus Christ. It has to be the blood of Jesus Christ that we, we can be saved. We can't be saved without the blood of Jesus. All right? And you, being dead... In your sins, and the, listen here, the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him and hath forgiven you all trespasses. How many believe God's forgiven you? But it just ain't by raising your hand and say, I receive the Lord as my personal Savior. He had to die. He had to pay a price for me and you. All right, go with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> it's just like I said, when, when Jesus died, and everybody, everybody think about this, the first thing they couldn't put, Jesus could not go into the grave until he died. 
He had to be put to death. First, he had to live a life, a perfect life. And then he had to be killed. And he had to be put in the grave. And he had raised from the dead to overcome. How many believe that? All right? That same operation is going on today. You just don't get baptized just so you can join the church. But you do. But it goes deeper than that. Jesus took all the sin upon him and he died. He went out in the grave. Three days later, the stone was rolled away and he rose up out of the grave. How many believe it? All right. When we repent of our sins and we come nigh to God and we get baptized, it's just the same as going down in the grave. We are dying, going down in the grave, and we're baptized into his death. We take part of his death, and just as he rose from the dead and sent it up into heaven, we raise up and walk in the newness of life. In other words, we're a different person. In other words, you, uh, people say, well, I, you know, when you go out there and you get baptized, it's going to change everything. No, what it's going to do, it's going to remit your sins. It's going to, you're going to be forgiven. And it's just like I was, I was talking to, and I've told this in church, talking to Dave and Jeanetta last night about remission. In other words, if Brother Buck here, if uh, I, I borrowed $100 off from him and he'd give it to me and I went on about a year and I still haven't paid him back and I just told him, I said, Brother Buck, I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't pay you right now. And he'd just say, I just forget about it. <laughs> and if I go on 10 years and even though you forgave me, but yet, it would still be in my conscience. Every time I seen Brother Buck, I think about that I owed him $100 that I'd borrowed that off from him. I had a debt. I was indebted to him. But if Jeremy come by and he said, did you ever, get, did you ever pay $100 back to Buck? And I said, no, I never did, never did get it. He said, <coughs> he said I'm just going to go ahead and pay it for you. And when I pay the debt, then just forget it. You know, it's paid. Now, after that, Jeremy remitted my debt. When I looked at Brother Buck after that, I wouldn't feel indebted to him no more because the debt was remitted. It was paid. And that's what baptism is for. It's to remit your <coughs> sins. When you come to God and you repent, God will forgive you your sins, but you've got to be baptized to remit those sins. In other words, to wash them off of the books, you know, Get to wash them out of your life. In other words, you can't walk with God when you've got all kinds of sin, condemnation in your life. The devil, he'll have a heyday with you. But once you repent, fully repent, and you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of those sins, all your sins you've ever committed, and all of the future problems you have, all of them will be remitted and taken away. But a lot of folks get baptized, and then they come out and live the same way they did before they went in. But I'll tell you, when you go in... You're, ta you're taking on the blood of Jesus Christ. And the thing about it is, if you go back out and, and waller in the pig pen again, the Bible said it's the same as trodden underfoot the Son of God afresh and bringing him to an open saying. And the very blood that's covering you and cleansing you, you know, you're doing the sight to it, you know, the Spirit of grace. But he said here in Romans, I'm going to start out verse 3. Remember we was talking about what, I'm, what I just talked about. I'm going to read it to you. He said, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Y'all see this? Ain't that what I just said? Yep. All right. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Do you all see this? Isn't yeah. that what I just said? Yeah. You see exactly. this? Everybody understand this? Okay? All right? Listen now. Verse 5, he said, And if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I'll tell you what, you think about Jesus. You think about how great a thing that he did. How the disciples went out with him and how they nailed him, nailed him to a tree. They beat him and they whipped him. 
And the thing about it is, he was rejected of his own people, them that he had walked and healed and helped. They all, you know, he was rejected by them. But he was carrying the sin of the whole world upon him. He came here, you know, some little something happens to us. And we're, you know, we get all upset about it. But you know what? When things happen to him, he didn't get upset about it, Brother Jeremy. He just bore it. He bore tribulation. He bore and endured all the things that was put upon him. And he did it for me and you. All the sin that you ever did. All the things that I ever did. He bore the guilt of it. He bore the sin of the whole world. And that's why it said, by his stripes were healed. People just quote that scripture and say, well, that's just so we can get healed by all of our disease. And I'll tell you what, the healing is in here. I know God can touch the flesh, Brother Johnny, but God wants to heal the heart, heal a man. I'll tell you what, I'm, God has healed me. Hallelujah. I used to be a thief, but I'm not a thief anymore. Hallelujah. I used to be a liar, but I'm not a liar anymore. I used to be a drunk, but I'm not a drunk anymore because I had an operation with Jesus Christ. How many glad you had an operation? And God put in you a new heart and a new mind. Thank God. And it, this operation was repent of our sin, get baptized in His name for the remission of sin. You know what? We was outsiders. We're just aliens to the commonwealth, away from God and away from his power, but yet God took his name and made us all sons and daughters, put his name upon us. Why wouldn't we want to be baptized and put on his name? The world goes and they baptize in titles, you know, they baptize in, in other names, but I'm glad that he made us a name. He said there's a name that's given among all names. There's not another name given among men whereby we must be saved than by the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. But we're buried with him. And the thing about it is we take part in his death. You know what? How many believe when Jesus died, he, he's not going to ever die again? He won't ever die again. He's going to die, and the things that he killed, they're left in there. And if we go and we do it, and our heart's right, when our sins go into that water, then they stay in there. They don't come out. But one place it talks about going down to the sea and to see a forgetfulness where they'll never be remembered. All the guilt and all the things that you've been through. If we believe in this operation that God is able to do that, you believe God's able to do that? To cleanse you and to change you and to heal you and to make you what he wants you to be. I'll tell you what, it takes a great power to come in your life to change you. I couldn't do, the, I couldn't change by myself, Brother Ronnie. It took God coming in my life to change me. I'm still not done changing. I'm, I'm still like a caterpillar, thank God. But one of these days I'm going to wake up a butterfly. Amen. Let me say amen. This whole body is going to go down. The Christ is going to raise up. This whole life is going to pass away. But God's going to give us a new life. But we don't have to wait till we get to heaven. We can start right here in this life. We can start living in the resurrection right now. Because He is the resurrection. He told Martha and when her brother died, thank God he was a, she was afraid. She said, Lord, if you'd have been here, our brother, he wouldn't have died. He said, Martha, said your brother's going to live again. And she believed. She said, yeah, I know, Lord, in the resurrection of the last day. But he said, Martha, I am the resurrection. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yes, shall he live. He is the resurrection. And in him there's no, there's no sin, there's no evil. He overcame it all. And he rose up and he sat on the right hand of God. It don't mean that God sat in heaven and Jesus is sitting beside him. But it means that he's raised up and made a kingdom for me and you. Where we can live in that kingdom. We can live in his presence until we overcome all the things that's in our life. All the wickedness that's in this world. All the sin that we don't know about. We're working on us. Like the song said, he's still working on me. Amen. He's still. How many's glad he's still working on me? Amen. I know I get, I get excited here. But I'll tell you what, I want to think what a great operation that he did. This operation that he came, but I son of me, he said, blessed, hallelujah, it behoo Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins would be preaching his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's where the church started. That repentance had to be preached. It's still got to be preached. Remission of sins has got to be preached in his name. We can't do away with it. But then comes a godly life after that. Hallelujah to God. We lay down that old sinful life and we take up a new life. Amen. Amen. Praise 
Folks don't, folk don't want to live right. They go in the river, a, a dry center, and they come out a wet one. But I'll tell you what, if we really get in the operation of God, he said it's not the, the washing away of the filth of the flesh, baptism, but it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. The water don't cleanse you, but it's the answer of a good conscience and being obedient to God. All the, all the blood that Jesus came out of his body could have never been enough to touch all the saints that's been there. But his blood run down into the rivers and into the streams. Amen. And there's a record of it. You know what? The oceans, the people don't know it, but the oceans know about it. They know that there's one in heaven. They know that there's one. He said there's, he's, he said, there's a, a father in the word. Hallelujah to God. The, head, the trees bow down to him. I think when the wind blows the trees, they'll wave their hands. And they'll say, praise the Lord. The world and the oceans, I think, the, and to me, when the, when the waves, when they raise up, they're clapping their hands and they're praising God. I'll tell you anything that comes in His presence, it can't stop praising Him. And when you come to the Lord, you're not going to be able to stop praising Him anyway. When you overcome your sin and you overcome your flesh and the things that's in your life, there's nothing. You won't be able to do nothing but raise your hands. He said in the heavens, he said when, when the heavens was there, he said the angels and the elders, they just praise God continually. I'll tell you what, if we can take off everything and change, we'll leave this world with our hands in the air. We'll be praising him all the way to glory because we're going to take off this old man and we're going to put on a new man, Brother Jeremy. I started putting him on 25 years ago, but it won't be complete until I passed off the, the very last one and that's going to be death itself. And when I lay that down, I'm going to be free, Brother Johnny. But we got to put off this old man. And we got to know. You know why Jesus died for you now? Amen. <laughs> you can say, you know why I quit drinking? It's because I'm part of that resurrection. It's because I believe in Jesus. Not just believe in the word that is written to me or because it was told me, but I believe it in my life because he became alive in me. I feel him in my soul. I feel him with me walking through the day. I feel him when, when I do something wrong and he chastens me and he changes me. And he don't do it because he hates me or he wants to hurt me, but he does it because he loves me. He wants to make me a better person than what I am. We chasten our children because we want them to be better than they are. We want them to grow up to, to be good men and women, honorable and honest, thank God, hardworking. We want to do a, God wants the same thing out of his church. He wants us to be honest and upright and hardworking and never, ever fail to praise him and lift him up in our lives. Amen. Just run out of stuff. To, I don't have enough time to get on this. You guys care if I do this all day? Nope. Amen. It sure feels good. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Listen with me now. Verse 5. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. How many believe he rose Amen. from the dead? Amen. If we don't change, then we can't say we believe in him. Amen. Because it's saying that if we've died with him, we're buried with him, we're going to raise to walk in the newness of life just like he did. <laughs> Knowing this, that our old man, talking about this old fleshy man, our old nature, is crucified with him. Now you know we're not. I've never been crucified. But crucified means it's, it's killing of the flesh, killing the desires, the lusts, the things that's in your flesh, the things that's contrary to God. Crucified as Jesus was crucified, all your lusts and, and affections, he, was cruci he crucified on him. Now we crucify him when we take part in this operation. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Our fleshly nature's got to die, it's got to be buried with him in death, and we walk in the newness of life. Now, if we be dead with Christ, how many's dead with him today? Are we dead with him? Well, if we're dead, we've got to be buried. That's why it says you've got to be baptized. Wouldn't it be awful, Sister Debbie, if I was to die and Sherry just left me laying around over to the house? Well, I'd start stinking and I'd start rotting. That's why a lot of Christians, their lives stink. It's because they need to be baptized and need to be buried. And they need to be buried in the name of Jesus Christ. You can't be baptized and buried in titles. It's not going to remit your sins. 
I can't remit your sins by the name Father. Brother Johnny, are you Father? Sure. Brother Don, are you Father? Brother Jeremy, are you Father? Can you take away sin? Nope. Brother Buck, are you a Father? Right. Are you a Father, Brother Ronnie? I'm the Father. I'm also a grandfather. And I'm, you know what? I'm a son too. How many sons we got son. here? A son is a, is a male. It's a male offspring of the human race. That's what a son is. Well, God, he was, he was a son. He came forth from God. He proceeded forth from God. And he came and he was a son. But that's not his name. Son is not his name. There's a lot of sons, but that's not his name. Father's not a name. But God, his name is Jesus Christ. It's why God said his name, we can call his name Jesus. He'll save his people. How's he going to save them? He's going to come and perform this operation. He's going to come into the human race, and he's going to cut out sin. He's going to cut out a place where we can dwell. He's going to cut out a land where they can live. He's going to cut out a kingdom where they can abide. Thank God. How many's glad for the kingdom? How many of that place you got and you're in God? You might be running down the road. You might be singing a song and you just feel the spirit of the Lord walking in that kingdom, feeling that kingdom all around you. The world's in turmoil. The war's all around. There's wars and turmoil everywhere. But we can walk in him and we can have peace. <laughs> all right. Um, verse 8. No, verse 7. For he that is dead is what? Freed is freed from sin. You ever hear that scripture says? The truth will make you free? Yep. Freed from sin. Okay? Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live, live with him. Yeah. You believe you're going to live with him? Amen. All right? Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. He's not going to die no more, is he? We can't go back and live that kind of life no more. Once we die out, we come out of that way. And death hath no more dominion over him. Once he rose up from the dead, death didn't have no power no more. How many believe that? Y'all see what I'm saying? In other words, right now, in, in natural speaking, death has got power over all of us here. We're all going to die. We're going to get old. We're going to watch one another. As time goes on, we're all going to watch one another die. But we re we're really the only thing that's dying is this old house that we're living in. Our inward man, it's not going to die. It's going to live forever. All right? Verse 9 said, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in... That he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also.